It's not a topic that's looked at very often, but it is something that you and I need to be very aware of. We need to absolutely understand what God is doing in that, in this process called judgment. And so um, let's look at this verse. If we go to the last book in the Bible, the last chapter of the last book in the Bible, Jesus said, look, I am coming soon. My reward is what? With me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. Hmm. How does that make you feel in this moment? God's going to give you according to what you've done. What do you deserve for what you have done? Yes. We deserve death. But isn't it a wonderful thought that because we are covered in Christ's righteousness, that he's going to reward us with eternal life? <sighs> Blissful thinking this morning. We are in Christ then the reward that we are going to get is the right to live with him forever. Wow. Glory be to God for his goodness and his mercy. How does God go about deciding what this is all about and what this, how he's going to look at whether you and I get life or death? Do you know that for yourself? Do you know that you serve a God that you can trust? Do you know that you know that you know that God loves you? Amen. Do you know that you know that you know that he is faithful? Amen. Yes. And that he is merciful? Yes. yes. Because these things need to be a foundation for you to understand the judgment process. Because last week we looked at a time of wrath. And we're going to um, unpack the things that come with this time of wrath. And it's going to be a time of devastation for many. And unless we are secure in who our God is, unless we know him personally, then we are going to get swept away in a tsunami of fear. And we will never recover. So, the story of the sheep and goats. Open up your Bibles this morning to Matthew 25. Last week we were looking at Matthew 24. And it's important that we carry certain themes and certain things over when God says in Matthew 24 that because of the increase of wickedness the love of most not some not a few but the love of most will grow cold that's a scary thought because that could include you and it could include me if we l allow ourselves to go there Let's read verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All, A-L-L, -L, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put his sheep on the right and he will put the goats on his left. And the Bible tells us that this is what Jesus says about the sheep. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Hmm. At a glance, we could say, oh, okay, well... If I go out and hand out bags to the homeless, I could check off one, two, three. And if I take clothes, four. 
And I'm certainly bound to run into someone who's not feeling well. And, well, I can always go do prison ministry and check, 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 check. Now, that's very appealing to the carnal heart that we make up the assignment and that we decide how we want to check these off. But that's not the way God works. God has the work. He asks us to join him in his work. So we're going to look at that today because we need to understand at, at a glance, this is like, oh, so God's going to judge me because I gave hungry to, food to the hungry. Whew. But actually what this is talking about is I am going to test your love at every level because ultimately we are judged on whether we love God and love others. That's the royal law. These things are about loving God because God says, if you've done them for me, if you've done them for them, you've done them for me. And so that's loving God, obedience. If you love me, you will obey me. And number two, that we love others. But let's break that down this morning so that we can open up our minds to what God is looking for and what he is looking at when he examines our hearts. It's imperative that we allow ourselves today to, to allow God to stretch us to maybe some things that we haven't been paying attention to, that God wants us to pay attention to as he's growing us on this journey called love. I mean, this, this journey on this planet is for you and I to learn how to love God and others. That you and I love like Jesus. That's a lot of love. That's a high calling. And it starts with humility. That's why Jesus says, if you've done it unto the least of these. We'll talk about, more about that in just a minute. So I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. It's more than food. I was hungry for companionship. I was hungry for warmth. I was hungry for good cheer. People are hungry for things more than just food. God sends you to feed others things that are not just food. He's looking beyond that. He's looking for heart-to-heart -heart connection. When Jesus fed people, he wasn't trying to just be a cafeteria for them. He was trying to get a connection with them. Through food, he got them to listen, because hangry began way back then, not <laughs> now. And so he fed people so that they would be receptive to listening to the deeper spiritual things. So he could give them spiritual food. God's talking about spiritual food that he wants for you and I to be able to be used to deliver. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was thirsty for loving care. I was thirsty for a bit of your time. You quenched my thirst. When has God asked you to quench someone's thirst? because they were in need of some of your time. Most of us would rather hand someone a sandwich and give them our time. And we might differ and you know, you might have $1 and, and someone else might have $5, so that might be different. But in time, we each have 24 hours, all the same. And that is the thing that we have the hardest time giving up because it's, it's giving up self. Wouldn't you rather just hand somebody $5 and say, God bless you than to have to sit down for an hour and, and give to someone. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was a stranger to friendship. No one cared about me. You invited me into your life, into your heart. When have you met people that just needed connection and God is wanting for you to make that connection? Visit the sick. I was sick and you visited me. It's about showing care and compassion but it's more than physical pain. Some people are afflicted with fear, tormented with bitterness, stricken with doubt, plagued with anxiety, suffering with depression, or grieved by betrayal. There are many kinds of illnesses out there. And people are needing a word. They're needing the healing balm that the, only the Holy Spirit can bring. And the Spirit uses people who 
have declared that they belong to God to deliver food, to deliver drink, to deliver friendship, to deliver connection, to give love, to be a conduit of God's love. He doesn't give us love so that we can just wrap our arms around ourselves and feel so good. Well, yeah, it does feel good to know that we're loved by God, but there's a purpose for it. And it's supposed to benefit God like it benefits us. And it's supposed to benefit all those around us. There's a theme that I started about six months ago. How is it benefiting God that that you are his? How, what good is the connection that you have to heaven? Is it just for you? Or is he able to call on you to do some of these things as he brings people into your lives? It could be in your family in your extended family, in your work family, in your church family, in your neighborhood. I mean, there are people coming and going that only you and I will touch throughout the day. And are you in tune with him so that you can be arms and legs and a heart and a mouth for Christ? That is what this is about. That's what Jesus is saying here. He is looking for those who were willing to listen to what he was saying. Go give encouragement. Go lend a helping hand. This one needs this. This one needs this. And our response, yes, Lord. That's it. Yes, Lord. And if you and I are going to become good at loving, there's pain and suffering involved. Because... Any time that I have to give up something I want to do for someone else, that's painful. Maybe y'all don't have that problem, but it's my ongoing problem. I have an agenda, and God says, well, this is my agenda. I'm like, oh. (laughs) All right, Lord. We just have to move along with with your agenda, because this is always his agenda, is loving other people. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. There are prisons of loneliness, of fear, the sense of being forgotten, insecure, not fitting in, not belonging. God wants to use us to meet the basic needs of people. Remember we talked about that last year? There's four basic needs outside of people eating and drinking. People need to feel appreciated. When has God asked you to do that for someone and were you willing to do it? God need to have a sense of achievement he, everyone was made to, to achieve something. Don't you feel good when you get your chores done? <sighs> you, when you accomplish something, it feels good because we're made to achieve things. Six days for work, remember? Six days for work. There are things to do, and when we finish them, we feel good. Also, we are created with the need to belong and the need to feel secure. All of these are basic needs, and God wants to use you and me to meet the needs of those around us. And if there's only five people around you, well, then God wants you to be faithful there. Not everyone's called to be around thousands of people. God wants for you to be faithful right where he puts you. Some people want to dream stuff up. I'm going to go to China and do this, and I'm going to go over here to Siberia and do this. God didn't tell you to do that. He wants you to be right where you don't want to be, right in the middle of your own neighborhood, right in the family where you are, where you're irritated and and frustrated. That is where you can learn. That is where the gold is. That is where the treasure is, right in your home, right at your work, right in your neighborhood. And it is through struggling and overcoming that Power from heaven comes down and fills you like no other. You know what I'm talking about. You've experienced and you know what? You need more of that. I need more of that. God's going to see to it. Are you getting ready? Get ready because he's going to see to it that you have opportunity to receive power from him. It doesn't come with the people that you love to sit next to and hold hands with and everything's good and dandy. It comes through the ones that rub you wrong, through the ones that just suck the life out of you. There it is. Yeah, basically. You know what I'm talking about. So it's like, 
not that person again, Lord. This person absolutely is more than I can handle. I'm like, you're right, Letty. They are because you are trying to do it instead of allowing me to do it. I want for you to do this. And if you will call on me and if you will ask, I will give you what you need. If you will seek, you will find the strength that you need. And if you knock, I will open the door so that you can get through there and get, do the work that I've asked you to do. So the problem's not that God's given me an assignment that just overwhelms me. It's that I'm overwhelming myself. I'm living by my feelings instead of living in his power in the word. That is always our trouble. So what are we casting? This is the word that God's given me this week. What are you casting? Where are you throwing out to people? What are you projecting on a daily basis? Because this is what he wants us to cast. Everywhere we go, he wants us to be sowing seeds. In the bulletin, sowing and reaping. What you are needing, God wants for you to sow that. If you are needing patience, then you, you sow for that. So that you can reap it. Yes. That is how it works. If you need some corn plants, you can't just sit in your chair. You're going to have to go plant corn seeds. If you want watermelon, you're going to have to go plant watermelon seeds to get watermelon. So whatever you are needing. So if you are in need of something, start sowing and watch God multiply it and bless your life. Ask yourself, what are you casting what is your life projecting? What is your life counting for, for Christ? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. I want to talk about the least because the least aren't the people living on the street. The least are the people that you do, are dealing with in, on an ongoing basis that just irritate and frust you, frustrate you like nothing else. The people that are just porcupines. Except that we forget that we're also a porcupine. And just because our quills are down right now does not mean that we're not a porcupine. Because it doesn't take much at all for those things to just stand out and start <laughs> impaling others. We, we will impale anyone when we are rubbed the wrong way. And so God says, when you are willing to go over and beyond for someone that frustrates you, for someone that you don't think is deserving, then I am pleased. It's not that he doesn't want you serving those around you. That's wonderful. But that's not really where the growth and where the character building is going to be. It comes when we are willing to deal with the least of these. We all have people that we look down on. We don't want to. It's just part of having a sinful nature. We look down on others. Oh, yeah, their house isn't as clean as mine. Oh, yeah, they don't do this. Oh, yeah, this. Think about it. We're all there. Yep. We all know that there's certain things that we just think we do better. Li not a lot, just a little bit. Not, you know, we don't want to elevate 10 steps. Just one's enough for us to be able to look down on someone. Those are the least those that you look down on where it hurts to love, that is what God wants to do with you and I. He wants it to hurt because learning how to love hurts. Ask Jesus. It cost him his life. He endured pain and suffering that you and I will never endure because he endured it for us. And so love always requires Suffering of some kind. Remember I told you last week we had a GPS on this journey called learning how to love. And it is up to us to be tuned in by the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what the Lord wants us to do. So the separation of the sheep and goats is the judgment process. God's love for the planet compels him to do whatever it takes to save the most people possible. What is in this word. I'm not making it up. It's in your Bible. Got what God has to do. In order to save the maximum amount of people. 
It's astounding. It's shocking. It's overwhelming when we start looking at what is coming on this planet in order for God's children on this planet, all 8 billion, including me and you, what it will take to get us to listen, what it will take to clear the distractions, the idolatry, the selfishness, the pride, the arrogance off the table so that only God matters. That's why this is coming. So the great tribulation is the backdrop of the separation of the sheep and goats for those that are alive when God says, this is it. This is day one. The book of Daniel tells us that there are 1,335 days. The time of wrath. From day one to Jesus coming in the clouds is 1,335 days. God has much to accomplish in this time. It is not one day too long. It is not one day too short. There is a reason for what God is bringing and it requires there to be timing is perfect. The great tribulation will come like a thief in the night, even for those who are looking for it. You and I are looking for it. It's still going to be like a thief in the night. Whew. Quick. It's going to happen. It's going to be shocking. It's going to be devastating. God will test each heart before he seals it with all eternity. This is what most people don't get. Most people think we're going to be raptured out of here. We don't have to worry about any of this, lady. I'm like, I would love to believe that. I would love for that to be true, but it's not biblical. Never in earth's history has God removed his people when he needs for them to be a testimony to who he is. God's people are always to be a testimony to God's goodness. We are ambassadors for him. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so who else is going to declare God's goodness except for those who know him and love him and are willing to, to go through and be overcomers? It's a testing ground. And God's going to strip us down and he is going to absolutely, it's going to be the best of times and the worst of times all wrapped up in one. So if you'll go to the book of Revelation chapter 8. I'm going to go through some of these verses here. I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Okay, a trumpet in the Bible is used for sounding an alarm. It is used for giving warning notice, used for calling people together. There is something that God needs to say, listen up. There are seven trumpets. Right before the seven trumpets begin, in order that the whole world knows that this is it, there will be an earthquake. And this is found in Revelation 8, 5. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. Notice, on the earth is going to cause, this censer is going to cause devastation like we cannot imagine, along with peals of thunder, thunder that will be heard all over the world, deafening, frightening thunder. Every one of us has been in a horrible thunderstorm before where we shuddered at how it felt like the thunder was right over our house. Well, this is going to be beyond anything we can imagine. The rumblings from the earth and lightning is going to be out of this world in an earthquake. It's going to shake. God is going to take the globe and shake it like you and I would, sh would shake a snow globe. And there's going to be devastation happening all over this planet that we will never recover from. Everywhere. We're used to seeing things like this in other places and we're like, oh, it's so sad. We need to pray for these people. But we are going to be those people. There's going to be devastation everywhere like we have never 
seen. And life is going to change in ways that we can't imagine. This is going to be us. And where will our heart be in all of this? Will we understand that God is a God of love? See, this is, this is where you and I need to be secure. This is being done because God loves. And it is time for his arrival. And the earth must be prepared to meet him. So he will do what he has to do. The global earthquake is to get the attention of everyone, but it's not enough. There's more to come. Isn't it sad to know that God has to do this because we are this wicked? Because we are this distracted? Because we are so steeped in idolatry and in sin, the world as a whole? So the seven trumpets are annou they're an announcement. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Wake up, get prepared. Jesus is coming. Your creator, the judge of mankind, is coming. If there was any other way, God would do it a different way. Because he's perfect in everything that he does. We have to understand, like Isaiah says, that his ways are are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. The seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first trumpet, a third of the trees are burned up. The first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. So an asteroid shower that's going to affect, this is what God says is going to happen. Fires like we've never seen will happen. And we have seen localized in California. We saw them in Bastrop. We've seen where it's happened, but this is going to happen everywhere. Because God is serving notice to the entire planet. It will be known that this is going on everywhere. It's not a localized thing. God is saying, Get ready. The second trumpet is an asteroid impact on an ocean. We don't know what ocean. Will it be the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean? We don't know where it will be. God doesn't give us that information. But we know what has happened when things have happened in the ocean where tsunamis have taken place. And it's devastating. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain was all ablaze. John is writing this down and how do you write asteroid? You know, like a huge mountain. He sees impacting the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Massive tsunamis will destroy everything within that radius. We, we've seen this happen before. And it's going to bring lasting effects. God is, is dealing severe blows one at a time to the planet. Crippling the planet forever. We will not recover. This world is used to, this happens disaster. Everybody gets the Red Cross and Salvation Army. And they go and they help people. Wherever you are, that's where you're going to be. You're going to be the help. People are going to have to pull together. When you sit down and think about what's coming, get ready. We need to be ready spiritually. We need to have hearts that are prepared to experience what's coming. Because it's going to devastate even you and I that know about it. It's going to be... who We've never seen the wrath of God. We don't know what that looks like. It's, it's serious. It's going to be beyond anything we can imagine. God is going to destroy a third of everything... You know, many people get food out of the sea. A third of everything will be damaged. And there will be no more shipping to, to happen. Economic collapse is coming. We're used to things coming from China and Indonesia and things going back and forth. That's done. That is gone. Again, each trumpet, each thing that happens, God is telling us, get ready. I am coming soon. The third 
is an, another asteroid impact, but this time on the Earth. We don't know where it's going to be, but somewhere on the planet, the third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star like a torch, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. There will be much death during this time. So this asteroid impact, can you imagine coming, falling out from the sky? I mean, an energy that exceeds hundreds of atom atomic bombs that will break loose the tectonic plates deep in the earth and everything will be affected. Sewer systems, wa drinking water will be contaminated and the, the impact of all these things, cumulatively speaking, as you know, you go from earthquake to burning hail to two asteroid impacts, the damage gets more and more, the devastation. People will fear for their lives. How are we going to survive this? And that's why the, the biggest part of this that I want for you to get is how you're going to live through this, if indeed you, you are in this time, is your connection to Jesus. <coughs> If you know that your God is faithful, if you trust him, you will trust him in this. Once you get past the shock, some of us will sit like Ezekiel did when God used to pick him up from the hair and blind him over here. And he just sat there for seven days in shock. What just happened? We'll, we'll be a bit like that. It will be shocking. But we'll have to pull ourselves together. We know that this is coming. Now, God, what can I do to... Feed the hungry, give the, to those who are thirsty, attend to those who are sick and imprisoned and blah, blah, blah. Spiritually speaking, that's, that's who we're going to be. That's what God is looking for during all of this time. Who loves God for who he is and who just wants relief from the things that have, that have come? Who wants just blessings and gifts? Who wants the gift giver? Within a few days, tens of thousands of people will die from drinking poisonous water. Because when you're thirsty, you'll drink what's there. And the water, God says that this particular trumpet is about poisoning the water system and telling us to get ready. Death isn't the worst thing that can happen to us, friends. That's not the worst thing. That's sleep. Woo! Get to sleep through the rest of the trumpets. Yay! If that's, if that's my lot, hooray. If the Lord intends for you to see him coming in the clouds, and that would be awesome, then he's going to sustain you through that. You're going to go through some horrific times of testing, yet you're going to witness God's hand in powerful ways. So whatever God says, we're going to be happy with. If we die in the first trumpet or whether we live to see Jesus come, it's, it's good. Whatever God has planned. The thing is, you and I need to live by faith and trust him and know that the first death is not a problem. That's just sleep. Jesus calls your name in the twinkling of an eye. You're on your way up to meet him. It's the second death. It's not being awakened when Jesus comes if you're asleep. That is the danger port part of this story. Because Jesus has warned us that because of the increase of wickedness, as it was in the days of Noah, the love of most will grow cold. Selfishness, greediness, self-centeredness, pride, arrogance is going to rule. And people that don't trust God and that are angry at God, can you imagine how many people are going to be angry that God has done this because they've been sold Deception. Don't worry, you won't be here. But we are. Now what? I don't know. You can't just conjure up faith. There will be much devastation for people. And then the fourth trumpet is darkness. God is going to darken all that gives us light. The sun, the moon, and the stars. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark, 
A third of the day was without light. However many hours we have of daylight, it's going to be reduced. And also a third of the night. That means the moon won't give its light either. When all of this shaking happens and all of these impacts happen and everything shifts, the volcanoes that surround the middle third of the earth will be spewing ejecta and the jet stream will take it all the way around. We've already witnessed things like that. Like when they're burning stuff in Mexico, we get it, you know, things come from far away depending on the jet stream. The Holy Spirit will be directing the jet stream and he will bring all of this to be and many people will die during this time because it will affect people with respiratory problems the young the old the devastation that is coming on this planet and what it takes to get our attention it's just a devastating thought all the way around it's horrifying to think that God has to do this because we are in this place of wickedness so a global famine will begin. When you are, after this kind of crippling of the planet, there's going to be little food. And so those that love Jesus will have to totally depend on him. And like he did for Elijah, he took Elijah and put him by a little brook and gave him fresh water there and the ravens brought him food. Elijah probably could have never imagined that God would care for him that way. But he did. He will for you and I too. He, we don't have to worry about that. He knows what we need today. He knows what we will need tomorrow. And he will provide. Our job is to wait on him and to trust him. It's not going to come on our timetable and it's not going to come how we think it should come and how we want it to come. God has ways to answer prayers and take care of problems that you and I know nothing about. Yay! Yeah. Aren't you so glad that you don't have to, you know, God's not is kept to our limited imagination? Yeah. No, he's beyond that. He, he has ways to do things that we know nothing about. But it will affect the livestock. It will affect everything. And God is saying with each trumpet that comes, get ready. God is going to break his silence. Now here's the thing. And there's so many. Anytime that I teach on Revelation story, I am, I feel, it's, it's frustrating because there are so many parts. And it's hard to, which part, which part to tell here and which part to tell there. There is what God is doing. There are the decisions that you and I are making. There's what the world is doing. There's the devastation of the planet. And all these things are moving together. God is working in it all. You and I are living through it all. The world is dealing with it. And the devastation of the planet is there. And so God is doing all of this. Because he has something to say to the people on planet earth. And he is going to empower a little Gideon's army. A little Gideon, Gideon had 300 men. And that's what it took. God's going to empower out of 8 billion people. 8 billion. He is going to empower 144,000. Lord, are you sure that's enough people to get the message across? It's a lot of people on the planet at this time. 144,000 people will be empowered, like the disciples were, to go out and take the gospel to the world. And in the process, you and I will be arms and legs because it should benefit God that we're connected to him. And as they were sealed... And I'm not going to talk about that today. So will we be sealed in our decision. So that part of the story is incredible. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the world's response to what God does. Because it's not the response that God would have wanted. They don't, the world will not respond like Nineveh did. But you and I need to. God breaks his silence. This is what happens. <clears throat> John says, I saw another angel flying in midair and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim. To who? 
every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. Every. Guess what? Christians need to hear it again. You know why? Because the eternal gospel has been watered down. Who is preaching that Jesus is the creator and worship him according to his commands? Very few people. And God is going to get that message out. So the, the eternal gospel is going to be presented on the clearest of terms. You know why? Because we're not going to have iPads and TVs and cell phones and all the things, Facebook, and I was going to say Instacart, Instagram, all the Instas, all the, all the, all the, the devices that we have so that everyone in the world knows what we're doing every minute of the day because they're so interested in what I'm doing every minute of the day. All that's going to be gone. It's gone. Now what do we do with our time? God says, I'll tell you what you're going to do with your time. Listen up. That's what you're going to do. I have something to say. Every person has to hear this. There are seven religious systems in the world. Catholicism, heathenism, Judaism, Islam, Eastern mystics, atheism, and Protestantism. That's us. Christianity. God wants every person to hear what he has to say. And here's message number one. Fear God and give him glory. Uh, the second part of this series was fearing God. If you didn't get a chance, if you weren't here, go back and listen. The fear of the Lord is, is imperative for God's people. You and I cannot be a part of God's family and part of his coming kingdom without fearing him. So, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. You are going to be judged right now. Are you ready? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Worship him. What does that mean? Let's see. For some people, it means going to church. Er, wrong. For some people, it means singing songs. If you sing your songs and raise your hands, that's worship. Er, wrong. Worship. Worshiping the Lord is always about submission. Acknowledging that he is sovereign God, the boss of me, but the, a boss that I am totally in love with. I have the best boss in the world. My boss loves me. He delights in me. He has redeemed me and summoned me by name. I belong to him. He has an inheritance for me. I'm going to be joint heirs with him. Yes. Acknowledging. Bowing to him. Then my songs and my prayers are part of the worship. My songs and my prayers and my life become part of that. But it isn't that. It's not going to church and singing songs if I am not living a life of obedience and submission to my God. And God is going to be demanding worship at this time. Yeah, demanding. The first message is a call to worship to acknowledge Christ that he is the judge and the creator of the world. Submit to his authority. Obey his commandments, including the forgotten fourth commandment. That one's forgotten. I mean, most Christians would totally agree. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't use God's name in vain. Do not commit adultery. You know, check, check. Those are all good. Yes, we all need to live like that. What's happened to the fourth commandment? Delete. And because the fourth commandment has been deleted out of people's lives to worship on the Sabbath, to rest on the Sabbath, the creator is forgotten. He created the Sabbath in creation week. It's not a Jewish thing. It's not a faith fellowship thing. It's a God thing. Way back in the book of Genesis, you go to back to the very first page of your Bible, you're going to find that Jesus created the seventh day Sabbath. At creation, way 
way, way back there. It, he didn't make it for the Jews. He made it for all of us, for his people. And that is going to be an abrasive thing. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Why this is important that we get this is because God just destroyed all of those things. God's saying, uh, I am the, create, the one that created these things and just destroyed them. I'm calling you on the carpet. This is to the world. I'm calling you to come stand over here and to acknowledge that I am coming and I'm going to give to each one according to what they have done. Do you want my righteous covering or do you want to stand on your own in your own naked self in front of me? Do you want my covering or your own covering? You're going to sew up some fig leaves and come stand before me? Unfortunately, there will be many of those that have deceived themselves into thinking they can provide their own covering. God's demand of worship will be abrasive to most people. And that shouldn't surprise us because the love of most has grown cold. Most Christians believe that obeying the Ten Commandments is not necessary. So that we're going to have to make a choice whether we will love God through obedience or love self and follow the world. This is what the book of Revelation says during this time of wrath. It calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God. And who are they? Those who keep his commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Remain faithful. That, that was a word that God highlighted. These words God highlighted for me this time. Remaining faithful. They go to get, keeping the commandments and remaining faithful. Trusting God, knowing you will get me through, you will get me through. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Galatians 5, we learn that faith expresses itself through love. So brothers and sisters, as we wrap up today, this part, because next week we'll look at the world's response and how God's people fit into that. And the fifth trumpet is going to be more terrifying than these four that we looked at. As we move forward, the last three, which the Bible also calls woes, are terrifying. So if you think this is bad, we're not, we're not done with, with that yet, what God is allowing and, and the, big, the big picture for that. For you and I today, rather than then be overwhelmed by, oh, I'm not going to be able to handle all that and live through that because that's just natural. When, when we're looking at it, it is devastating. We will be devastated. We will be horrified. We will be shocked. We've never seen anything happen like this globally. It's never happened before. Other than the flood, which was over the world, we've never seen this. We've seen different types of disaster, but we've never seen God's wrath poured out over the planet. When we think about these things, we have to think of them in the context of, number one, how much God loves us. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves all his, of his other children the same way. All sheep. He wants to, the Father, every soul is a soul that the Father wants to bring home. Every single one. And what you and I need to know is that God is trying to rescue every single person through this. The Holy Spirit will be pressing on every person. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And there will be people that don't know him that will get to know him. For you and for me that claim to know him, we better know him. Because there is a purging coming out of those that God, that proclaim to be a part of God's family that are imposters, that are just going through the motions of going to church without being in the pressure cooker of learning how to love. And God's going to sift through all of that. So may you and I take seriously what God is trying to do in our lives. May we be living a life of repentance so that we can have the humility foundation that we need in order for God to use us 
to be arms and legs of his love. And so that one day when the king puts the sheep on his right, the sheep are going to say, when did I do that, Lord? When did I give you something to eat or something to drink? They're, they're going to be so surprised that God's saying, look at all you did for me. Because it was what they did naturally. They were listening to the Spirit and loving people was just what they did. They didn't think they were doing anything special. They were being obedient to the Holy Spirit. The goats, however, are going to say, but, but, but when did you ask me? If I'd have known you were asking me, Lord, I would have done it. God said, no. No, I tried so in so many ways to teach you how to love. You refused me at every turn. Now he says, you get to go into the fire that's been prepared for the devil and his angels. May we take this seriously today. May we truly internalize God's love for us, his plans for us, because he is worthy of our heart's affection and our heart's adoration. Children of the living God, you are his. May you have hearts full of gratitude and praise today so that he can use you to do great and mighty things for his name. Because I just read what those great and mighty things are. That's what Jesus says. Are great and mighty for him? It's called humility.